So there's a bishop, and he advertises a job to ring the bell in his church, in the bell tower. The only, the only applicant is, a, is a, a hunchback with no arms. So the bishop says, how can you do this job? You can't pull the rope. Hunchback says, I have a plan, but we have to go to the top of the tower where the bell is so I can show you. And uh, he says, okay. They went all the way up the stairs to the bell tower. Bishop says, okay, show me your plan. So he runs in, jumps at the bell, striking it with his head. Sure enough, he rings the bell. The bishop says, that's amazing, but you'll get a headache. Hunchback replies, no problem. I'll get used to it. And so he gets the job. One day the hunchback decides to put a little extra into his bell ringing. So he steps back and then he runs and jumps at the bell, hits it with his head, but he misses slips and falls off the tower, plummeting to his death. A crowd gathers and a policeman arrives. A bystander asks, do you know this man? And the cop replies, no, but his face rings a bell. Sorry. <laughs> Should have said his face used to ring a bell. Romans chapter five, first five verses is therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us would you bow your heads with me dear Lord this morning having been entrusted with your word and having access to the power of your word we pray that that power and anointing will rest upon each one in the house today accomplishing what you would have wanted to accomplish in Jesus name. Amen. So this is a very familiar story. We have a man named Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press. What's wrong with this picture? Well, Gideon is a big chicken, pollo grande in a t in uh, in Spanish. And he's a desperate big chicken. Then the angel greeted him and called him a mighty warrior. This is strange. Strange things going on here. Gideon's in the wine press threshing wheat. Today the word of the name of the name of Gideon is, is uh, common because of the Gideons who go around placing Bibles in uh, hospitals and in, in hotel rooms. But the rise of Gideon from the threshing floor to the battlefield, is what we're looking at today. Judges chapter six, beautifully portrays the journey from doubt to faith. It reassures us that God in his infinite mercy remains patient with our doubts and fears, providing the reassurance we need. It reminds us that even in times of disobedience, if we sincerely repent, God will hear and deliver us. Finally, Gideon's story reminds us that greatness is not a birthright. God's call can elevate the humblest among us to serve his purpose. So in, verse, in the first uh, six verses, we have we're told about the oppression by the Midianites, the Israelites having forsaken the Lord, which they did often. They would forsake the Lord, 
go back to worshiping Baal and Astra, and they had done that. So they find themselves under the oppressive rule of the Midianites for seven years. God allowed them to be under that oppression. Their crops and livestock were ravaged, forcing them to hide in mountains and caves. And that's why Gideon is in the wine press. So if we go to verse, uh, starting with verse seven, the prophet's message, God sent a prophet to remind the Israelites of his past deliverances and their current disobedience, reiterating that they should not worship other gods. And they were worshiping Baal at this time and Asherah. So then uh, verse 11 to 24 is the calling of Gideon. The angel of the Lord, of the Lord appears to Gideon Initially, an unassuming farmer and calls him a mighty warrior, prophesying that he will save Israel from the Midianites. Doubtful, Gideon asks for a sign which the angel provides by setting a fire to a sacrificial offering. Gideon even had enough nerve to say, wait, I have to go and prepare this offering. So the angel says, okay, I'll wait. That's the way God is, you know. But Gideon then, the angel, the angel had a stick in his hand. He touched the stick to the offering. It burned up. So then Gideon, then, then Gideon recognized the divine nature of his visitor, but the Lord reassures him, peace do not be afraid. And I would add that angels scare people. Almost every time we see Angel Gabriel bring in a message, and people are, he always has to say, don't be afraid. But he scares people. Then down to verse 25, God commands Gideon to destroy the local altar of Baal and erect an altar to God. Now you got a picture. This is a culture, a Baal worshiping culture, and God commanded Gideon to destroy it. He's just a farmer. So despite his fear, Gideon complies, earning him the name Jerubbaal, meaning let Baal contend against him. So in verse 33 to 40 then, Gideon requests signs. The Midianites and their allies gather for war, prompting Gideon to ask God for a sign of victory using a fleece of wool. You're, I'm sure you're all familiar with these stories. But God grants the sign, not once but twice, reassuring Gideon of his presence and his promise. As you, as you recall in the story, he put out a fleece and he requested that the, the fleece be dry and the dew around the ground around it have dew and then he wanted to reverse that he wanted another test because he was a hard guy to convince you know what i mean he was a hard he was a tough guy to convince so they reversed that and this time the, the fleece was wet but the ground was dry and the chapter chapter six narrates a a crucial period in the history of israel this era of oppression, doubt, faith, and ultimately divine intervention. The chapter unfolds with Gideon, um, a man of humble origins, rising from this threshing floor, which is not really a threshing floor, but inside of a wine press, to become a judge of Israel under God's divine guidance. It outlines the Israelites' plight under Midian, um, the oppression, due to the disobedience of the Israelites as they fell into this idolatry of Baal worship and of Asherah worship. Their cry for deliverance, the calling of Gideon, his tests of faith and his preparation for war. 
So the Israelites are being oppressed by a very nasty people called the Midianites. The Midianites <coughs> would wait until the Israelite crops were ready. Then they would swarm over the land with their animals, would devour all of the Israelite crops, and then they would steal their flocks and their animals. So they were starving. The Israelites were desperate. They were in hiding. They needed a hero. So we have to have a look and see who these idiot, idiot, <laughs> Midianites, <laughs> who the Midianites were. After Abraham's wife Sarah died, he remarried. His second wife's name was Keturah, and A Abraham and Keturah had five sons. The middle one was Midian. So this Midian was a son of Abraham, and from whom the Midianites came. They were descended from Midian, who was a son of Abraham through Keturah. So we don't really, you know, I read, I've read this 28 times. I read the Bible annually, and it never really penetrated me. But when Joseph was brought out of the cistern, when his brothers were going to kill him and they put him in a cistern, and along comes a caravan of Midianites, which were his cousins, really, maybe fourth cousin, something like that. And it was the Midianites who carried him down and sold him into slavery in Egypt. Midianites. And they were cousins because they all descended from Abraham. <clears throat> when Moses fled from Egypt to the backside of the desert, he was in Midian. Moses married the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Midian. If Jethro was God's priest, truly God's priest, then it must have been some vestige of Abraham in his conscience. So we go to Exodus chapter 18, starting with verse 9. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel. Who's Jethro? Moses' father-in-law. He happens to be a Midianite. But he's delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 10, he said, Praise the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, all these people have two names, it's confusing. Rule was his other name. Then Jethro, uh, Jethro Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. This is getting stranger and stranger. But that's, if you, if you, if you want to see what's happening in Judges chapter 6 with Gideon and the oppression of the Midianites, it's good to know who those people were. And that's where they started out. They were, they were, they were, the, they were descended from Abraham. So the call of Gideon in, Ju in Judges chapter 6, it starts on verse 1, with the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Verse 3, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites and other eastern peoples invaded their country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza It did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like a swarm of locusts. It was impossible to count them 
<clears throat> or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Now we're still in chapter 6. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So the wine press belonged to Joash, who was Gideon's father. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Mighty warrior hiding in a wine press. Pardon me, my Lord. Verse 13, Gideon replied, But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? That was a good question. Why? Sin. That's why. They abandoned God and they worshiped the Baals and they worshiped Asherah. It's because of sin. Where are, all his, where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. And it was because of their sin. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and, and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? In the strength you have. That's pretty awesome because when God calls us to do something, he calls us to do, to go out, to go in our own strength. Then he comes along with his strength to help us finish the job. Pretty awesome, amen? So God calls us to do things for him. You know, all we have to do is move out in faith. Then God partners with us in, with his strength. But he said to Gideon, go in the strength you have. Well, he had enough strength to thresh out some wheat in a wine press. And verse 15, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. So observe in verse 16 that the angel is now referred to as the Lord. This was the Lord. Um, it wasn't just an angel. Now we go down to verse 25 and 26. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Wow. That was a prized thing of his dad and, his, and of the community. This idol, he's going to tear it down. He's going to tear down the Asherah. Asherah was always represented. Her shrine was usually always near Baal's shrine. And it was always a, sometimes a grove of trees or a tree that they cut the limbs off of. But it was a pole, Asherah pole, they called it. Now we go to chapter 8, the first uh, eight verses. The chapter opens with the Israelite troops led by Gideon camped beside the spring of Herod. God tells Gideon that his army is too large. You guys know this story, I'm sure. He wants to ensure that the Israelites know it is God and not on their own strength that delivers them from the Midianites. So he had a two-step test. First, send home everybody in your army that's afraid. So he dismissed everybody that's afraid, go back home. And the God, and then, and then he made a test about how they were to drink water. Some of them would drink water out of their hands and some would, would lap like a dog. 
So God reduced the 32,000 to just 300 men because he wanted to show that it was his power and not a whole bunch of soldiers that won this victory. Verse 9 to 15, that night God instructs Gideon to infil infiltrate the enemy camp where he overhears a Medianite soldier recounting a dream that predicts their defeat at Gideon's hand. This significantly boosts Gideon's confidence and strengthens his faith in God's promise. Verse 16 to 23, Gideon divides his 300 men into three groups, 100 in each. And each was equipped with trumpet, an empty jar, and a torch. On his signal, they blew the trumpet, smashed the jar. That means now light was there because it, the, the torch was in the jar. Smashed the jar and shouted, causing confusion and panic in the Midianite camp. The Midianites, thinking they're being attacked with a large army, turned on each other, leading to their defeat. Verse 24 and 25 was the aftermath. In the final verses, Gideon sends a message to other Israelites in Ephraim to detain any fleeing Midianites at the Jordan River. They captured two Midianite leaders and presented their heads to Gideon, marking the end of the battle. So he had 300 men. He had 100 with him and 100 over there and 100 over there. They kind of around the camp and they had a shout. They broke the jars, let their light shine forth and blew the trumpet and the enemy started running around killing their own selves. In Judges 7, we witnessed the extraordinary narrative of Gideon, who despite his initial doubts, places his trust in God to lead a significantly outnumbered group of Israelites to a staggering victory against the Midianites. It's a story that exemplifies faith and obedience. Those two things go hand in hand. Demonstrating that with God, even the seemingly impossible can be achieved. I'm sure I could bring the microphone around and you could each tell me something impossible that God has done in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 to 30. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. It's in him. It's in Jesus. It's in the cross. Gideon had to recognize that God was calling him. Psalm 91, 15. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. God knows when he wants a certain person, which is you, <laughs> sometimes me, to do something for him. We all have a calling. It's, it may not be a calling to ministry, but sometimes it's a calling like Scotty had to pray for his friend. Sometimes it's a calling to pray for somebody you see that's struggling and you don't even know who they are. 
But God says, go pray for that person. It's not a hard thing to do. But when he wants to call the person, John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. We know when God is calling us. Sometimes we're in denial. You don't have to win a war, but you might win a battle in somebody's life. You only need to be willing to go to accept that calling and to just go. Like God said to Gideon, go in your own strength. And then he threw in his strength. Gideon had, this is point number two, Gideon had to renounce the sin of his family. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. He tore down his father's shrine to Baal and the Asherah pole. He had to construct a proper altar to God. He tore down the sinful and elevated the holy. He sacrificed his father's bull on it. That's what he was requested to do. He had to rise above what the family and the neighbors would think. Some of them wanted to kill him. They said, bring him out. We're going to kill him. We have to be holy. As long as the altars to Baal and Asherah remained, there would be no victory. We have to operate in holiness, otherwise there will be no victory. We have to be willing to stick our neck out. We have to accept the call to operate in the strength he gives us. Number three, Gideon had to obey. Isaiah 119, if you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. Even though he had doubts, he did everything God wanted him to do. God overcame Gideon's doubts. He tested the Lord with an offering and with two different fleeces. Well, we can do that. We can put out a, put a fleece and say, Lord, show me. We're okay to do that. It would be best if we just obey and move on. Just do it. Practice hearing from God. Anticipate being called. Don't worry about being prepared. The ones God calls, he prepares them. Gideon didn't have a degree in military strategy. <laughs> he didn't have anything like that. He wasn't at first even willing to go, but, but he tested and God proved himself. And the Midianites were destroyed. Number four, the victory belongs to God. Psalm 60, verse 11 and 12. Give us aid against the enemy, for human help is worthless. With God we will gain the victory, and he will trample down our enemies. Every powerful thing that God does is for his glory. It's all about him. When he does something powerful or wonderful in your life, you get blessed. But be careful to give the glory to God. Amen? Deuteronomy, I'm, I'm going to finish with this. Deuteronomy chapter 30, 11 to 18. Now, what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend to heaven and get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. 
See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. It didn't take long for the Israelites to go with Baal and Chemosh and Molech and their infant sacrifice was the same with all three of those demons. And Asherah, the Ash, shrine to Asherah pole, they were all there. They were there. And they were doing that. And that, that worship of Asherah, it was like an orgy right out in the open. That's what they were doing. And it offended God that they would do that because he's the one that brought him out of Egypt. It offends God. I think it offends God when he sees what people are doing today around the world. It offends God. He was patient for a while. <laughs> he's being patient right now. I don't know how long that's gonna last. Nobody knows, but He's God. He's God and there is no other. Amen. Would you stand? Our God reigns in our hearts. He doesn't reign in everybody's heart, but he reigns in our hearts. There's a pedestal in your heart. And that's God's place. If something else is on there, it doesn't belong on there. That's God's special place in your heart. Once you get saved, ask Jesus to be your Lord. Then we need to invite him to control the thoughts and the things that we do. Amen. So, Father God, we take this lesson from Gideon today, which is a story that we're all familiar with. And we ask you to reveal it to us in, in, in a new way and show us where uh, where we need to change, if we need to change. And Lord, we, we look for a calling. Gideon wasn't even looking for a calling. But we do, Lord, and I pray that everyone in here will recognize a calling. We don't have to defeat an army. We might have to defeat a demon or the work of the enemy in some person that's close to us or in a stranger, Lord. So I just pray that this message will rest on each heart, Lord. And go, and as we go our separate ways, we pray uh, travelers' mercies and bring us all back safely next time we meet. In Jesus' name, amen.